Good afternoon. Welcome to another exciting day at NYU. I hope you're appreciating the weather at the Global University, where the sun always shines. <laughs> um, we have a particularly happy occasion today. Uh, for me, we have uh, Robert Cruz visiting us from Stanford University. Uh, Robert Cruz made his name uh, very early on by writing a book about Islam in Imperial Russia and put forward the proposition that Islam was actually um, intrinsic to imperial governance as opposed to outside of imperial governance or as opposed to outside of the imperial system as a whole, uh, which is quite an eye-opener. I think it actually transformed the way we understand uh, religion, Islam, and diversity in the, in the Russian Empire. He did no less than that, uh, which I think is quite an accomplishment. Um, he's moved on since then. He's still interested in Russia, as you'll find out today, uh, but he's also been interested more in uh, Central Asia, South Asia, um, uh, with a, a, a co-edited volume on the borderlands between... Um, would this be Waziristan? Or, or sure, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Yeah, yeah, the border areas between Afghanistan and Pakistan, which has a lot to do with drones, or actually tries to take our attention away from the drones. Um, uh, and then most recently, I think it's the most recent book, right? Um, Afghan Modern, which is what he's speaking to us about today, uh, which is a, a, an attempt to actually put some substance into the idea of global history. Uh, so, for instance, we're the global university, but we don't know what that means, right? But well, here we're actually trying to... I don't know, Yanni. Don't, yeah. don't promise things I can't do. Yeah. 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 That's my first point. Point number one. I don't know either, so... What, what I can promise you, what I can promise you is that um, Robert Cruz actually thinks these things through and, and gives them some substance. Uh, so whatever he's going to say, I'm sure will be intelligent, and we look forward to all of it. Thank you, Yanni. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yanni is, is not only a great scholar and friend, but he turned out to be a wonderful publicist uh, who I've recently discovered works for free, it turns out. So <laughs> I couldn't recommend a, a better um, publicity hound to help get um, positive and perhaps inflated expectations out in front of this talk. So thank you, Yanni, and, um, and thank you to, to Heather and to Natasha for catching my good side and um, not making me look more foolish than I already make myself. Um, so where to begin? Like many, many books, this book has a kind of circuitous path. Um, as Yanni noted, I began um, as a PhD student working on Islam and the Russian Empire, and I've been pushed and pulled further and further south um, to areas where I thought research, research would be easier. In fact, in some ways, it's been more difficult. But for those of us uh, who have worked in Russia, you know that circumstances there are challenging. And yet, as we'll see today, uh, it doesn't get easier as you move south. So this is a, a kind of case study in um, trial and error, with lots of error built into it, because I thought I'd be working on Central Asia still, I thought I'd maybe be working on a project that would um, involve the Caucasus, I explored archival research there, um, but I kept getting drawn further and further to the south, um, in no small measure because of our contemporary politics, um, the challenge of the ongoing American war in Afghanistan. Um, but I still feel obligated to explain why we need another book on Afghanistan. If you go to your local bookstore, or if you go online, you'll find dozens of books that have appeared since 2001, which attempt to explain um, not just Afghan history, but particularly the lenses why the American project has, has faltered there over the last 15 years. So the, the lens of, um, of the war and its failures have really dominated our thinking and, and certainly our scholarship about Afghanistan. So I set out in this book to try to offer a critique and an alternative to that mode of thinking. Um, that way of thinking dominates journalism, it dominates uh, policy making, and it still dominates a lot of, of scholarship. And my contention here is that we have gotten Afghanistan wrong, um, and the consequences have been disastrous for Afghans themselves, for the United States, and indeed for the world. And I try to argue in the book that the, the categories that we have, the lenses through which we see Afghanistan, don't really fit. They don't really fit the reality of the country and of the wider region. Um, and in fact, that most of our frameworks for Afghanistan are really um, an assortment of imperial legacies. In fact, we need to study those imperial legacies rather than take them as the lenses themselves. In short, we've inherited a set of tropes about this place. We imagine Afghanistan to be a kind of jumble of tribes, trapped in time, wholly unlike ourselves, shaped by a desolate and unforgiving natural environment of forbidding mountain landscapes, dotted by primitive mud dwellings. Um, in fact, photography has played a, an oversized role in shaping how we understand this place. And so thankfully this was the, the cover that I was able to negotiate um, from my publisher. But they started out with something that looked more like this, which is beautiful. It's a kind of uh, beautiful cityscape view of Kabul from a mountain redoubt. And yet if one looks at book covers um, that adorn books about Afghanistan in the last 20 years, they all have the same quality. 
it's almost as if there were one single book designer that has recycled the same image. Um, and here, typically, we see no people. Right? There are no humans. This is a, a kind of moonscape uh, that is that is desolate. This is this forbidding. That is that is dangerous. Right? Um, the, the question of time is central to it because in this photograph, though we have a bit in the distance of, of what we might call urbanism, the foreground really is um, is a is a space that you know, is undateable. Right? It could be the time of Moses. Right? Mud dwellings, the kind of unmarked landscapes, uh, wholly unlike um, cityscapes elsewhere on our planet. Elsewhere, um, temporally wholly different from our own modern times. So thankfully, um, my editor agreed with this, and I was able to go with something that conveyed um, urbanism, modernity, commerce, leisure. This is a, a tea house, actually, in Kabul, um, as an alternative to, to this kind of image of, of um, an empty, menacing space, which is simultaneously a threat to civilization in the wake of 9-11, of as New Yorkers know well. So the, the trope that sums up many ideas um, is, of course, the graveyard of empires. This is the theme that um, belongs to the 19th century, but which people have recycled again and again in the last um, two decades. Um, it's often referred to as a place so barbaric and unwelcoming, um, and with the capacity to resist, resist outsiders, um, that even the great empires of, of successive ages have, um, have failed there, in succession from, if you like, from Alexander the Great, through Genghis Khan, through the British to the, the Russians, and then now us, right? That, that trip occurs again and again. And of course, underlying this notion is the, the claim that Afghanistan is a place um, who, by its nature, is unchanging. Um, things like tribe are timeless. Uh, in some writers' accounts, ethnicity is the key underlying framework which guides all Afghans in their politics. And that, too, is meant to be probably being constant over um, hundreds of years, if not a millennium. And of course, there's the problem of, of Islam. Islam provides a framework for us to think about this space, which is mostly, mostly Muslim, in fact, but as I try to show in the book, there actually are, there are moments of pluralism which are quite important, which have to do with international and, and global politics. So these are all distorted uh, lenses onto this space. Uh, but what are the implications of this? What are the moral, ethical, intellectual implications of this thinking? Um, I can offer a brief list. Some of these ideas are, are mutually contradictory, but I'll highlight a few that have to do with our own time. First, that these ideas actually validate a narrative of salvation. They, narrated, they uh, validate an external narrative to, to intervene in this country, to remake this space, right? Um, this place was mired in the past. It needs to be kind of um, unmoored from these ancient um, foundations somehow. Um, some of these tropes are also used to explain why violence is necessary in this place. And here it's often um, indirectly stated, but the implication is that uh, these simple primitive people can't really be reasoned with, so one must apply force, right? They only, only understand the, the vocabulary of, of force. This, of course, is an old British colonial idea that had first been applied to this space in the early 19th century, but I think echoes of it remain with us today. A third reason we might cite, uh, a third use or implication of, of these ideas, um, has been to divert us from critiquing post-2001 policies. And this is a, a move that began, I think, late in the George W. Bush administration, which essentially um, began to divert blame to Afghans themselves, right? The Afghan, the American and NATO project, projects there that faltered, because it's the Afghans themselves. I mean, we made the right moves, but the Afghans um, weren't sophisticated enough. They weren't modern enough to engage in the kinds of politics that we had uh, introduced to them, right? They weren't um, modern enough to, to accept our generous gifts of, of civilization, of democracy, of liberal institutions, and so on. Um, and so now our, you know, the New York Times has especially been active in, in circulating ideas about the, um, you know, about religious fanaticism, about sexual deviancy, that's a major narrative, uh, about violence toward women, all things which are presented as being exceptionally um, Afghan. A fourth implication is that um, it's now a justification in 2016 um, to claim that this space is beyond re redemption, right? It, it doesn't really merit our attention anymore because it's, it's, um, it's hopeless, right? So we're justified in ignoring this place because it was, it was uh, always this way, right? Uh, Afghanistan has never really changed. It was broken before, and it'll be broke, uh, broken after we leave. So I try to argue that all these images are, are inaccurate, they're unfair, they're unjust. Uh, it made them are, in fact, also racist and, and Islamophobic. So the book, I try to offer some alternatives. So, so what are they? And here, um, Yanni may have exaggerated my, my optimism about global history. I'm still trying to figure out whether or not I believe in that subject and whether or not I know how to do it. But I've taken a stab here. I think, actually, um, we are at a time when um, 
various tools in our liberal arts and humanities have given us um, wonderful tools to think about uh, this problem, think about the possibilities of, of global history. Uh, people in this room have given us great uh, ideas about how to do this. And to me, what's most exciting about the possibility of global history is that, the, on the one hand, the attention to, to scale. I think people approaching different scales has been really productive. Um, but not just in the field of history. I think we could also look to anthropology, which has moved far beyond the really formative discourses which shaped how we understood Afghanistan. So if you look back to the literature of the 1960s and 70s, when one could do field work there, when there was something called a you know, field of Afghanistan studies, anthropology was in a different place. Right? They were more often um, inclined to think about cultures as, as bounded entities. Um, they thought about uh, ethnicity in, in very different terminologies. They thought about the field in different ways. Often with ethics that we would admire, right? Um, this isn't a kind of moral judgment, but simply that the, the discipline itself has moved on beyond the field of Afghanistan studies. They worked up ethical and other critiques uh, to pose alternative ways of thinking about culture, about ethnicity, about how we study such places. And here I, I point to our colleagues in, in African studies, actually, who have really been especially helpful in thinking through things like the tribe, right? What does the tribe mean? Of course, they're um, modern day Africanists speak about tribes as the product of contested political claims, right? They see these as, as um, of, of spheres of activity that are um, often intersecting with colonial legacies, but which are very much uh, kind of dynamic stories of active contestation and of competing arguments, and not simply what um, a, an anthropologist or ethologist can arrive on the scene and then map, right? So the story's gotten much more complicated and interesting, and we can draw on those insights in the study of Afghanistan. Now, field work in Afghanistan has not, uh, unfortunately, gotten any easier, but one can do some work around the margins. I was able to do some um, oral history work there briefly. And also, you know, as I try to show my book, the, the Afghan diaspora is, is a very serious political phenomenon when I take it seriously. And so I was fortunate enough to do field work in um, a number of neighboring countries where I was able to interview Afghan um, men and women. Of course, there's a community in the United States, but I found some in the UK and in Turkey uh, and, and Russia, Uzbekistan. Um, and Russia is very important for this story, too, because the, the archives of Russia hold very important um, repositories for the study of Afghanistan. Now, our Soviet colleagues had already been mining these for very important studies, but I think we're now only beginning to, or at least I'm only now beginning to appreciate what their contributions are, how they fit in, and even their colleagues working there today who are doing very important work who have invested in the study of Dari, Pashto, Urdu in some, some cases, and um, they're drawing on Russian and, and former Soviet archives to do very important work which um, have made a shift focus from what was a long time a, a, a British orientation. So much of the scholarship we get on Afghanistan comes by way of the Foreign Office, where one also needs to work. It's an important the British Library. These are all important repositories of Afghan materials, the view from Peshawar, the view from Quetta, the view from Delhi. That's part of the story I try to tell here. And also, of course, one of the National Archives of India, where I also have some material here. These are all very important, but the, the Russian angle, I think, is um, the Russian Afghan angle is important, I think, for us doing Afghan history, but for all of us also doing Russian imperial history. The, the story of that frontier is, I think, as important as the story of the, or nearly as important as the, um, the uh, Afghan Indian, or the, the uh, Indo Afghan frontier, or the, the um, Afghan British frontier of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, we also are very fortunate to have uh, a vast new trove of um, memoirs of. Of, of uh, the intellectual work of, of Afghans themselves, who despite the, the very um, complicated story of Afghan politics today, are actually enjoying a moment when um, Afghan publishing is, is quite strong, when the, the field of Afghan letters and arts is incredibly dynamic, it's transnational, much of it takes shape outside of Afghanistan itself. Uh, there are important writers in, in India and in, in Iran and Australia and Europe and the United States, and they're all contributing to, I think, a rethinking of, of Afghan history, what it means to be the Afghan, and that is kind of a, um, a silver lining of um, the American NATO umbrella, if you will, the security umbrella that the United States has offered in the last 15 years. And we now have um, a very rich print literature um, of especially memoirs, which are, are emerging as an important source to think about rethinking 20th century Afghan history. So that's the why. That's my justification for why we might need uh, a new book like this. Um, short though it may be, and, and ambitious though, though it is. So the how, what is, what is the approach that I, I offer here? Um, my approach here is to try to, to write a global history of Afghanistan, uh, which is a, an amorphous, sprawling subject, but I try to limit some focus by concentrating on something that I've called globalism, and it's a kind of a, 
I realized that the, uh, my German colleagues are still grappling with how to, how to define this, and I've gone back and forth with German colleagues about this. Um, I've slipped modern into the title um, for reasons that we can talk about later. I do that with some ambivalence. But my real interest in this was telling a global story. I had recognized that um, Afghans have, really before they became the largest refugee community in the world in the 1980s, um, they can be found across the globe. And we can trace those, um, those movements as historians. So in the book, I present the story of Afghan traders in Africa, of uh, poets in Iran, uh, religious scholars in Iraq, pilgrims in Jerusalem, uh, seafarers even in, in India, entrepreneurs in Australia, uh, some of whom come back with Australian wives to Afghanistan, carpenters in California, students in Turkey, workers in London, and even writers in, in Europe, places like, like Denmark. So on one hand, my use of the term globalism here means uh, to highlight the physical mobility of, of Afghan communities. A second meaning which I try to introduce is, um, is really a kind of umbrella term for um, all manner of connectivity. And here I, I've been inspired by a vast literature now on the global flows of migrants and of commodities. Uh, in this case, some of the key commodities are, are guns at various moments. Um, they can be poetry at other, others. Um, in our lifetimes, of course, things like cannabis and opium. Those are the, the stars, unfortunately, of, of Afghan global connectivity. Um, and then much of that you know, is known, and that's familiar terrain for lots of scholars, but the contribution I've tried to make here, and really I think the most one of those promising directions for other scholars to continue with and do more work than I've done here is to, to really explore the ways in which Afghans have engaged with um, intellectual currents that transcend national and regional boundaries. So uh, part of this has to do with the circulation of news. If one thinks about the way in, ways in which Afghans are aware of the world um, at critical moments in the 19th, 20th centuries and then today, um, I was very surprised to find in my materials um, numerous references to men and women who had in fact, a very sophisticated understanding of contemporary news and politics and, and the sense of, of world events, um, probably having to do with physical connectivity, but also with an imagination that um, put Afghans in connection with events elsewhere. The imperative to maintain a state um, that was being squeezed both, both by the Russian Empire and the British Empire made it imperative for Afghans throughout the space, mostly in towns, I mean, for sure, but presumably in, in outlying uh, more rural areas, um, they had real incentives to know what was happening. Rumors of Russian troop movements, for example, spread through bazaars very quickly. Traders carried word of um, troop movements in the north. There was a, a continuous anxiety in the late 19th and 20th centuries that the Russians were coming. And that had real, real effects on, on people's lives. It would affect the price of bread. It would affect the price of various uh, consumer goods and markets. And people were, were quite attentive to uh, news that might come back with a traveler from Mecca, or news of uh, someone seeking work uh, in the Ottoman Empire or someone who even had gone as far as, as Europe. We find lots of um, Afghans, especially in the 20th century, who go to Europe to study, uh, to trade, to uh, buy things for the Afghan state. So um, from a very early period, I argue, these people are, are well connected. And overall, kind of the, the argument, hey, Steve, Hacken, welcome. You're just in time. To hear about um, what I call the cosmopolitans. These Afghan thinkers, especially in the 20th century, um, are not just people who come to terms with what identity is defined by someone else. Again and again in the 20th century we meet Afghans who think that they in fact um, are not offering provincial adaptations to global questions. They think that their answers are universal and they think that um, their country is fated to answer the pressing uh, questions of the day. We meet a major strand of intellectuals doing this in the 1920s and early 30s. Um, and then we meet them again in the 1970s and 80s um, on both the right and the left. People look at the world and say, Afghanistan is not a periphery, it is in fact a, a dynamic center. It is a kind of moral center, it is an ethical center, it is an intellectual hub of <coughs> global events. So the, 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 the continuity that I try to um, address over the modern era is really that the, the sense among lots of Afghans that the Afghan state project, Afghan identity, is something, um, a kind of unique gift to the world. And so in a sense, Afghan nationalism is like many other nationalisms. All nationalisms have this kind of vanity, the narcissism, of imagining that they are um, distinctive, right? That they are somehow blessed with some sacred mission. They're exceptional. They're unique. They are anointed by God. Afghans too um, developed this idea, and it really has had a striking kind of imprint on, I would say, popular politics to this day. I was struck on a flight from. I begin the book with a uh, kind of silly anecdote. On a flight from Kabul to Dubai, I sat with people who initially were quite unfriendly. They warmed up as the beer and scotch started flowing. And then the banker sitting next to me described how Afghanistan was going to be the next Dubai. 
is going to be the next Dubai, and he's buying houses in Kabul, and, and as, you know, the Afghans who weren't in the know were fleeing, he was accumulating property, and Afghanistan was going to be this great hub connecting east and west, and transport, this idea that it would be a, a mediator of global flows of people, ideas, commodities, um, was what made him optimistic that, um, that Afghanistan had a, had a unique future that would surpass Iran, surpass Dubai, and that um, it was nearly a matter of time before Afghanistan finally assumed its place as a, uh, a centerpiece of, of, of globalism. So in short, um, my focus on globalism attempts to show a very different story. Um, I treat Afghanistan as an expansive space that accommodated varying kinds of networks that crisscrossed the region and the globe. Uh, I chose this mode of analysis rather than uh, imagine Afghanistan to be a, a static collection of tribes or ethnic groups, as most scholars tend to do. Um, and then I argue uh, throughout the book that, that we can no longer understand this place as being isolated from the global circulation of modern politics. Of course, the national lens isn't perfect everywhere. And, you know, there are lots of scholars doing transnational history, global history. But I think um, the kind of ethical blind spot here is that by not doing more of this work before, um, by not highlighting these diverse interconnections that link Afghans to a wider modernity, we also fall into thinking about Afghans as being you know, the, the other, right? The, the other alien, primitive people. And from that, we have lots of important political implications with which I began the talk. So some illustrations. How, how does this actually look? What are the possibilities of actually thinking through this, um, this grand narrative of, of Afghan connectivity, of, of mobility, and of globalism? Um, though most of the book actually takes, takes place in the 20th century, I thought it was important to begin um, uh, with a moment when there were Afghans, but there was no Afghanistan. Um, in kind of Afghan nationalist historiography, um, this is a, a bad move, right? I, I expect to catch heat from that from my Afghan friends and colleagues in a way because I, I treat the period when there's a Safavid Empire, a Mughal Empire, there was, a, there was an Uzbek Empire, uh, places like Balkh are city-states that look to the north, they look to Russia, they look to Moscow, when you have lots of people moving through the horse trade across Eurasia, when you have accounts of merchants uh, going to Kazan, some being murdered there, that's how we know about them because they end up in, in court records there. Uh, we find them as far away as, as, as Moscow, perhaps beyond, um, when they end up in trading fairs all over um, you know, the kind of frontier of Eastern Europe and Russia in the 15th and 16th centuries. So to my mind, the story has to start there. Again, there's no Afghanistan. Uh, the language, the term exists, but of course there's no political entity known as such. Uh, but in fact, the, the early modern imperial era is one in which we have various kinds of cosmopolitanism that we can trace. We have all kinds of networks. Some of these are commercial. Some are diplomatic, others are religious, uh, literary, artistic. And here we have an example of, I think, a, a 15th century manuscript um, describing um, the uh, Chinese uh, imperial politics. And this is produced in Herat, along with lots of other, um, you know, the, the tradition of Herati uh, manuscript miniatures, which circulate broadly from the Balkans to, to North India. And places like Herat uh, are very much central to this process. Heratis would find employment all over Central Asia, North, North India, and as far away as, as the Ottoman Empire, crossing all the space. Um, and so empire, the way I use it here is not, of course, the, you know, it's not a place of graveyards, it's not something about conquest, the ebb and flow of foreign conquerors who wreak havoc in Afghanistan and then are opposed and have to move on. Instead, empire here is about connectivity. It's about um, how empires, of course, engage in, in conquest, but they also connect people. They create markets, they link uh, market towns together, they link intellectuals, which I think was really um, one of my primary interests. So they link figures like a, a poet that we know about from the second half of the 17th century, first part of the 18th century, named Abdul Rahim, who was born near Kandahar, again, late 17th century. Uh, but he spent most of his life, we know, in, in Iran, in fact, where he found patrons for his poetry there. And then like many other itinerant intellectuals, Sufis, um, and, and, and artisans, he went on to Bukhara, um, now in Uzbekistan. Uh, there, he apparently was uh, introduced into multiple Sufi orders. Um, this is quite common. Scholars of Sufism are, are familiar with this, where one might simultaneously pledge allegiance to um, two, three, possibly four Sufi orders, which would then introduce one to different modes of, of discipline, different ways of um, exploring the Sufi, um, Sufi mode of life and, and, and piety. Um, he was a, an avid translator of Persian and Arabic texts into Pashto. He's one of the first people to really um, act as a conduit between those vernaculars and, and Pashto, which had become a, was a fairly recent 
uh, recently um, written uh, vernacular language. Um, yet his poetry, scholars have shown, is quite interesting because it expresses a longing for the gardens and shrines of the Kandahar region, uh, which was his birthplace in southern Afghanistan. So though he circulated widely, he, there was something about him that, um, that brought him back to Kandahar as a kind of, some sense of home, uh, some kind of regional belonging there. But we find lots of Afghans who, in fact, um, belong to these very vibrant cosmopolitan imperial worlds. They found patronage in, in Delhi, at, at the, um, the imperial capital of Agra. Um, but they also found patrons in Isfahan and other Iranian cities. So these were hardly the hapless victims of, of foreign invasion or, the, or passive bystanders um, on some mythic highway of civilizations. In fact, these actors helped, um, helped shape these empires in important ways. Um, and they were um, very important in, in creating the links of our kind of early modern Persian world, which uh, was one of, of our um, very intense religious debate um, and of uh, the, the conveyance of science and uh, various disciplines uh, in which Afghans participated. And here the, the, the ethnonymic terms are, are somewhat complicated. We can return to that at the end. But I try to follow my sources um, using the, the ethnic terminology of the period without claiming that these, these are uh, exactly lined up with our contemporary labels. That is, that's a, an early gesture to show that the ethnic labels themselves are, are dynamic, right? They're not, our readers aren't meant to understand that they are, you know, Uzbek in the 15th century means the same thing that it does when we see its sources in the 21st century. So there's a long way of saying that the story of the empire here is, is not one of pathology, it's not one of Afghan exceptionalism, it's not the graveyard of empires. Um, in fact, it's a, a kind of global story, right? Uh, most times and places um, have, known, have known empire, imperial states, imperial politics. And for a long period of time, um, Afghans in these major cities are connected to these different polities outside of what we now know as the territory of, of Afghanistan. Um, they also play an important role in, in the end of some of these empires. Um, you probably know the, the dramatic case of the, the end of the Safavid Empire in 1722, in which Afghans from Kandahar play an absolutely central role. Um, so that story begins uh, to move into a longer history of Afghan state building, because uh, it's not just that these people are, are cosmopolitan subjects of these, of these diverse empires, um, but in fact, in the 18th century, Afghans began to embark on their own state building projects. I try to show that on the book that there are actually multiple state projects. The Afghans today remember only um, one, this figure, Ahmad Shah Durrani, who's um, Ahmad Shah Baba. He's the father of uh, the Afghan nation in modern Afghan nationalist thinking. Um, but I try to show how, in fact, he's very much a, a creature of, of Safavid and post-Safavid politics, that his, uh, his, his political institutions, his language, his mode of representing himself bar heavily from the Iranian imperial tradition. So in this image from the British Library, he's portrayed in the mode of Nadir Shah. Uh, for him, he worked, he'd been his treasure. Um, and this is an explicit expression of continuity with that ruling house. But even before him, if we return to the siege of, of 1722, when Afghans march from Kandahar onto the Safavid capital of Isfahan, which, as you know, is remembered in Iranian historiography as a kind of a campaign of raping and pillaging and of, and of wanton destruction, what we find is that Mahmoud Khan, later Mahmoud Shah, who's the, the, the person who launches this project against Isfahan and then onto an Afghan state, um, he already is thinking, he's already thinking about a kind of imperial polity as he marches on Isfahan. So uh, the Afghan state grows out of um, an imperial context and, and draws deeply from it in both the Iranian and, and then mobile cases. But Mahmoud Khan, his, one of his predecessors, um, recruits Zoroastrians. Uh, he recruits uh, Shia Hazaras, he recruits Baluch, he recruits Turks, Multanis, Armenians, and, and even Arabs. Uh, one account reported that he even had at least one Afghan slave uh, among his followers who helped um, lay siege to Isfahan, then ultimately lay claim to uh, some kind of state around Kandahar. So this state actually doesn't survive. The 19th century is a, a crucial period in the story I tell because it's really the space that we know is Afghanistan, um, and here this is a moment when you know, there is, this is one of the first moments when Afghanistan appears on a map. It's really a, a collection of loosely linked and contested city-states. But the story of, of Afghanistan that I tell here is really one of, um, of contests for European empires and various princely dynasties competing for uh, often patronage and resistance against uh, various European actors who range from the French to the British and ultimately very soon the Russians <coughs> approach from the north as they move on to Central Asia in the second half of the, the 19th century. 
Um, but here again, I try to argue that, that none of the features of Afghan statehood are particularly um, dysfunctional. Right? Um, contested borders, right? You know, the, the famous 1893 Durand line is often presented as one of the kind of uh, original sins of Afghan statehood, which remains a kind of pathology. Um, but if we think comparatively, think broadly, as uh, this crowd already knows, um, borders are contested everywhere. This is a state, like so many others, which is multi-ethnic, it's multi-religious. Um, Afghan historians have tended to treat that as, as pathological, right? The, the inability to resolve those kinds of things is, is often held against Afghan elites in the Afghan state. In fact, um, the Afghan state remains an imperial state well into the 20th century, much like other states. Um, in my chapter on the subject, I cite Eugene Weber, which you know is, uh, of course, a classic story of, of um, a French state building, and also quote a passage from Christopher Clark, who writes about uh, German nation formation, and I argue that yes, there are geopolitical differences. This is a different kind of physical and natural environment, and yet uh, what one can argue about France and Germany in the late 19th century. Uh, was true about Afghanistan uh, during roughly the same period. So it, this is, a, a, in short, a lot, an attempt to, to put Afghanistan within a comparative framework in a way, um, note where there are kind of exceptional features, but really um, shift us from thinking about all this as, um, as pathology, right? Um, and in doing so, I, I pay a lot of attention, I think, for the first time, um, relatively compared to other scholars, to the Russian frontier where we have very intense contests between the Russian authorities and Afghan authorities over the loyalties of people who occupy this very lengthy frontier, which stretches from the Wakhan Valley to the frontiers of Iran. We see people moving back and forth, playing states off against one another. We find Russian deserters fleeing czarism, um, fleeing sometimes uh, criminal prosecution there, traveling to Afghanistan as a refuge. Right? So this, of course, amplifies this understanding which Afghan elites would develop it that uh, Afghanistan is kind of refuge for all those who would flee empire in neighboring states. Of course, they're already receiving people fleeing the British Empire, um, but in the late 19th and 20th centuries, lots of communities are, are periodically abandoning Russian rule, um, seeking a better life in, in Afghanistan. Now, there are ethnic communities who share some, um, or share some commonalities, some linguistic affinities across this border, but what seems to matter more is the prospect of uh, finding land and water. Um, ethnic solidarity doesn't really motivate these people in the same way that we might expect. That's a kind of anachronistic claim. But they appeal to the Afghan emir. Um, and the Afghan communities appear to the Russian czar for land and water, for refuge, and um, for safety against violence by, at the hands of local officials. So there's lots of traffic back and forth. Um, lots of communities are moving. Whole families, or rather uh, communities of 2,000, 3,000 people, would move en masse with their livestock across the borders, going back and forth, sometimes into Iranian territory and back. So it's a very dynamic picture, really, through you know, some four decades, from the late 19th to much well into the Soviet period. People are moving back and forth. Uh, and this shapes how states respond. States have to compete for the loyalties of these subjects. Um, in many cases, the, the prospect of, of an Afghan immigrant coming to, to Tsar's territory confirms what the Russians think they're doing in this space. They think they are bringing civilization. They think they're bringing the rule of law. They think they're bringing justice. And the Afghans who come and often speak that language seem to confirm for the Russians, uh, what they're doing in, in this territory. The most important immigrant who would find some refuge in, in, on Russian territory was, of course, um, Abdurrahman, the so-called Iron Emir, who becomes really the, the crucial state builder in 1880 um, when he returns from uh, many years in Russian exile, where, by the way, he has studied Peter the Great, apparently. He has studied uh, what the Russians are doing in Tashkent. He becomes an advocate of a kind of modernization program, which is about constructing industry. And the first thing that he builds in Kabul when he returns and actually establishes his authority there is a, um, a, an armaments factory to create manufacture rifles on a mass scale. And his, his um, autobiography, which is related to a scribe, um, highlights all the ways in which he imagines that um, in a kind of Darwinian moment when the Russians are, are on the horizon along with the British, um, Afghanistan must engage in this modernization program which is about bringing progress, and he'll use the term progress. Um, already during this period to describe um, his program to construct, construct infrastructure, to construct industry, um, to make Afghanistan stand on its own feet at this um, delicate political moment, um, and also engage in a program of consolidation in which opponents need to be crushed, um, uh, foreign experts have to be brought in, uh, but in a way that you know, Afghans have to be trained in modern statehood, and that, that model statehood appears to be drawn very closely from Russian models, to which he's exposed in real life 
um, for several years in his exile in Samarkand and, and Tashkent. <coughs> so the story of, of creating a modern state is one that, that really takes us through the 20th century and beyond in, in Afghanistan. And what I try to emphasize there is that this is a, a multinational project. This is one in which Afghans um, of all social strata in some ways participate. We find wonderful accounts of, of British travelers who find in remote places of Afghanistan, they find people who address them in, in what one called a um, um, English in the airy manner of a colonial workman. That is, people who had been to Australia um, and beyond, and who could communicate with these British officers um, arriving in places they thought that you know had been closed off from a wider world, um, consistent with the trope of the, the so-called permanent kingdom. But in fact, many Afghans are circulating, um, developing expertise working on um, irrigation projects in Russian Turkestan. Um, they buy property in Russian Turkestan. They engage in, in trade there. They're still trading all the way. We find Afghan merchants at the Nizhny Novgorod Fair. Uh, we find them filing legal claims in Samarkand and in Bukhara and in Tashkent. Uh, they play a key role in drawing the Russian state into disputes with Russian Muslims and, and also with Jews, because some of these, the Afghan subjects who are active in Central Asia are in fact um, Jewish. They're not in fact Muslims. They are, they are um, Afghan Jewish communities who migrated in earlier periods from Iran. By the early 20th century, um, Afghanistan is one of the few remaining independent Muslim states. In 1919, Amir Amanullah declares complete independence for the first time uh, from Britain. And he does so in a way that, that poses a direct challenge to the new Soviet state. Um, and yet many Bolsheviks come to Kabul, they look to this new space as um, the kind of the vector that will take the revolution from uh, Bolshevik space into, into South Asia, into the British Empire, that will revolutionize the East, first with the, the Muslims of, of the British Empire. At the same moment, Afghanistan becomes a, a stopping point, sometimes a refuge for Indian nationalists and, and anarchists and all, all manner of radicals who come to Kabul and attempt to um, convince the Samir that um, Afghans should engage in warfare against the British Empire, that they should, in a sense, um, liberate the British Empire from the imperial rule. So as you know, there's the, there's the Caliphate movement, where uh, Muslims migrate from uh, uh, British space, which they think is, um, they declare illegitimate for, for Islamic law and Muslim presence there. And they look, again, to, to Amanullah and Afghanistan as a place where um, Muslim ambitions could be fully realized as the last independent Muslim state um, in in the Middle East and, and Asia. So we have wonderful quotes from Indian revolutionaries um, who go to Amanullah and his, his successor, Nader Shah, according from one, a figure named Mahendra Pratap, who argues um, before the Amir in 1933, that he should make common cause with nationalist India, Persia, Turkey, and Arabia to save Asia from the fate of Africa. Um, so this is an instance in which um, Afghans and their, their Russian and sometimes Indian interlocutors are thinking about Afghan politics on a global scale. Um, they, they know what's happening in Africa, and they are attempting to make an argument about what Afghanistan can do to, to avoid the same fate. The same figure was also very keen on the notion that Afghanistan was particularly ripe for capitalism, that is, for a capital order, because he argued it had a, an Islamic conception of society. And he argued that the capitalists of Europe and America could find here much more genial ground for their economic activity than in their own native lands. I want to enlist the sympathy of the proletariat, as well as the bourgeoisie, to accelerate the modernization of Afghanistan. And this particular version of Afghan statehood, Afghanistan would be a, a core part of um, what he called the district of ancient Ariane. And he is part of a, a broader conversation at the moment, um, which contended that, that Afghanistan was in fact the core of some kind of Aryan civilization. And many Afghan nationalists would take up this idea, partly in competition with Indian and Iranian nationalists, who in turn were drawing on German thinking at the time to some degree, to imagine that um, Afghan, Afghanistan was an ancient land which um, owed its inheritance um, to the Aryans, in fact, and that that conveyed a, a particular civilization which um, put them on a, a kind of path to, to dominate the region, that is, to, to master um, region, the, the regional politics. At the same time, though, we, in the late 1920s and 1930s, as people thinking about Afghanistan as a center of global politics, as a kind of answer to the in inhumanity of empire, whether in its Soviet or, or, or British forms, we also begin to see a very important argument about, um, about Afghanistan and, and humanity. 
Um, and when some Afghan representatives attended a 1932 disarmament conference in Europe, one of them um, argued this. He argued that um, this is a time when the British had been engaged in aerial bombing of the frontier, the Waziristan area, and had been you know, opening fire on civilian populations um, on the Anglo-Afghan um, border. But one of the, the representatives argued this, that um, in the world of humanity, this issue, that is the bombardment, blots very much the honor of the Afghans when aerial bombardment may be prohibited for all nations of the world and may be regarded as lawful for Afghans only. If in Europe, aerial bombardment is regarded against humanity, it is also against humanity in the case of the Afghans. The question that beautiful buildings should be given right of protection from the aerial bombardment and the humble cottages of the Afghans only be the targets of the bombardment, is this not, uh, this is not based on justice and equity. So that vocabulary, this idea that the Afghans um, are humans, they, they, they belong to be treated um, on the equal basis of, of other people, would also emerge in, in South Africa, where we find Afghans who, um, some of them had, had appealed to Mohandas Gandhi when he was an attorney there, um, but we see Afghans in our British sources when they begin to protest laws um, aimed against so-called you know, non-whites in South Africa, where they, they argue that as Afghan subjects, um, they sort of be treated on a par with other kinds of foreigners. It's also in this period when we see a very important scheme um, to really refine what the Afghan nation is all about. And this is done, once again, in a, in a global context. We see here in this um, image of the Afghan gymnastics team training for the Olympics, um, images that I think those of you who do European history and Soviet history will recognize, and then we encounter the cult of the body, of discipline, of um, people thinking through you know, the, the national past as something uh, corporeal. When we have debates about what is an Afghan language? What is Afghan culture? What, what does it all mean? And many of the answers that, that Afghan elites would offer this period was that um, the Afghan nation was about modernity and, and progress and industry and transport. In fact, the term transport would enter Dari at this same period literally as, as transport. Um, it would be um, directly uh, translated as such. And here we see the, really the, the, the establishment of the idea that Afghanistan has a unique presence as um, the heart of the East, the center of, of regional trade, but also of, of mining and of the development of resources which will make this space prosperous, which will make Afghans um, well off. It, the, the Afghan poverty will be uh, finally put behind them. And so we find in, in the uh, kind of elite publications of the 1930s um, a very strong attachment to very sort of modernist projects, like that are aesthetically modern, um, the cult of the factory, uh, and this may look modest in comparison, but this is all new, the idea of you know, a kind of mechanized life coming to Afghanistan is very much um, uh, a product that, that grows you know, in, in simple measure out of the, the Soviet challenge. Right? They, they recognize that, that um, in fact, there are important Afghan colonies um, in the new Soviet republics, and they're watching the Soviet industrial push. They watch uh, collectivization and industrialization under Stalin, and the Afghans want to uh, construct an answer for that, knowing that they are in a contest with the loyalties of subjects, especially in the north and that the Soviets remain um, a kind of civilizational uh, rival. By this moment in the 1930s, though, um, it, is, it is Germany who's really emerged to the fore as, um, as the principal sponsor uh, and investor in much of this modernization um, surge. So we can talk about Afghan intellectuals, we can talk about their, their dreams of modernity, but um, the investment is coming increasingly from German sources. In fact, um, there are lots of Germans on the ground. They are, in the 1930s, the largest foreign colony there. But this shifts in important ways during the Second World War when, as a result of, um, you know, Hitler makes noises about how he's gonna take Afghanistan. Some Afghan exiles, importantly, travel to Berlin and say, you can take Kabul in eight hours. Um, the, the, the Germans recognize that that's, that's foolhardy um, and they have to retreat. Ultimately, the German colony is expelled. And in their place come the Americans. Um, already in 1943, we have the first discussions of the first American embassy coming there. And um, we have the first American ambassador calling for the delivery of what he calls secular missionaries. Secular missionaries coming from America, not to convert the Afghans directly, but indirectly to essentially civilize them and to show them the way of, of American um, Protestant progress. And the, kind of the, the religious dimension is, is in the background, it's muted, but it's conveyed in communications um, between his post in Turkey and, and the State Department. The idea that, that Americans have an opening here, they have an opening to show that American civilization too is transportable, that even in this remote, seemingly remote place, um, we, have, we have room to demonstrate that American technology, know-how, and culture ultimately uh, will remake Afghanistan, remake Afghans, make them modern. 
So the story of the 1950s and even 1960s is one of the, uh, the contest, which is moving into more perhaps familiar training for some of you, where the Americans and Soviets are, um, are treating Afghanistan as a, a centerpiece of this global Cold War struggle, where both sides are pumping tens of millions of dollars, ultimately hundreds of millions of dollars, into developing an Afghan infrastructure. They're, they're constructing um, an infrastructure for aviation, they developed the Ring Road, which will become so famous later. Um, and they're also engaged in, I think, lesser known things, which will become important. They are introducing um, educational programs. They are introducing a family planning program, which is actually quite successful and, and broad-based, so that um, even in rural areas, Afghan women are getting access to birth control, which is um, almost unthinkable today. But institutions like the Asian Society will become influential there. And, and really, um, in echoes of the present, it would uh, focus on on the status of women. In fact, lots of foreign um, advisors from, from throughout the Soviet bloc, Soviet Union, uh, West Germany, uh, and elsewhere will focus on the plight of, of Afghan women and girls. They'd introduce the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts. Um, they would introduce uh, family planning. But really, the accent was on showy infrastructural projects which would um, consolidate the hold of the Afghan monarchy. So this is a very, um, in a way, conservative policy that the United States pursued. But by the 1960s, people were noticing that things had, had, that these infrastructure projects had had a major impact. Um, Kabul and the major cities were connected uh, like never before. And in fact, the Afghans wanted the world to know that, that Afghanistan was a kind of centerpiece of a new kind of civilization, a new kind of awakening in Asia. One of the proponents of this view, uh, a figure named Preeta Chalizi, wrote a book in 1966, which is kind of uh, a kind of tourist manual, and he described how Afghan women, in particular, were unhesitatingly taking her place, uh, the Afghan woman, is taking her place in school and hospital, in factory or office, and even in the air, that is describing the new Ariana Airlines that had female stewardesses. Indeed, where there's work to be done, she is eager to try her hand at it, if thereby she can help her country and her people on the road to progress. So this is most, um, most clearly visible in places like Kabul, where the city itself had been remade by this period. The Soviets had built a new um, so-called micro rayon, on the model of a kind of Khrushchev era housing. Um, and there was also a new city where many Europeans and a kind of international community had, had gathered with a laid out city reflecting urban design, with new places of sociability, cafes, uh, ultimately things like uh, movie theaters, <coughs> hotels where people had beauty pageants where they saw films, uh, new spaces for the mixing of men and women. The introduction of telephone would have a major impact in, in the way that um, young people would interact. There are great anecdotes about um, girls calling boys, people prank calling, people they didn't like, and this kind of underworld of, of communication um, which people have observed again in Afghanistan today. So that the introduction of this infrastructure you know, tells wonderful stories about um, the, you know, a new, new way of, of being urban, new kinds of, new kinds of commercial spaces with um, department stores and so on. But the argument I make in the book, in fact, is that much of this actually um, sets the stage for the revolutionary turmoil of the 1970s, because this infrastructure on the one hand, props up the monarchy, but on the other hand, um, highlights for many Afghan thinkers the inadequacies of the Afghan political system. So you have, against this backdrop, which one could read as a story of progress and of, um, and of the march of modernity in a kind of progressive sense, instead, more and more Afghans recognize that um, the Afghan countryside remains mired in poverty. Um, some of these guys read Maxim Gorky, and they begin to say, we can have a Pashto or a Dari literature which should convey the same ideas the same kind of realist sentiments as, as Maxine Gorky, and we can finally tell the story of the Afghan worker who is toiling in these new uh, enterprises, or the, uh, the Afghan farmer, farmer who is um, almost the slave of his, his landlord, and then we can reproduce the kind of socialist realist critique of this state. So of course in more formal terms we get a, a, a revolutionary party which comes to the fore in a moment of a political opening in the mid-1960s. They are borrowing partly from Soviet models, and some of them have very loose connections to uh, Soviet authorities, but they're also looking next door to the, the two-day party, that is the Iranian Communist Party, uh, and that's where they're getting, from what I can tell um, from my research so far, that that's actually where they're getting most of their ideas. They're getting it, it's mostly being filtered through the Iranian left and perhaps to some degree the, the South Asian left, from, from Indian and, and Pakistani interlocutors. So as we get into the 1970s, the, the story gets more familiar to you, the story of the, the Afghan revolutionary coup in 1978. Uh, the American and Soviet attempts to shape Afghan politics from that moment. And here, again, for, for scholars who have studied the Cold War, this is where I think we, we get to train that you've already encountered, 
But here I try to show that, I try to really highlight the role of Afghan actors in shaping the contours of these events. We can study them from Moscow, we can study them from, 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 um, from Washington, D.C., but I spent a lot of energy trying to understand how Afghans themselves saw the moment of the jihad and its aftermath. And what fascinated me most was um, perhaps of all these artifacts that I encountered over this period, um, actually were two pieces, one published in 1991, one published in 1993. The first one, 1991, was published in Peshawar, um, which was a, a, there was a journal that was funded by the USAID and the CIA, it was part of a jihadist landscape, which had, um, it really made Peshawar kind of the epicenter of a, of a global jihadist movement. We now know, of course, that people like Abu Musa al-Zakawi, people like Osama bin Laden, frequented this space. But for me, it was, was more she was the, the Afghan angle. What were Afghans doing? How did they come to think about uh, their roles as, as intellectuals? Um, they're getting American training from you know, American uh, journalistic experts. But what they developed, I think, was a, a distinctive voice, which um, ended up being a critique, you know, first of the Soviets, but then of, of the American presence. And, and the way in which the Americans had, had shaped uh, their world. By 1991, 1991, of course, the Soviet Union has, has collapsed, um, and this is a moment of euphoria for not just Afghan jihadists, but for the global scene. They imagine that they have caused this to happen, and that for some of them, the next step is to take us back to places like Libya, to Jordan, to, to Palestine, uh, to Syria, and to you know, have their own revolutions there. Uh, but for the Afghans, they were still focused on, that was, they had a, a kind of distinctive focus on, on Islamicizing Afghanistan, on bringing that revolution home. But we found one thinker in one of these publications, 1991, who, who used um, an interesting text to reflect on, on these, this global moment. And he chose um, for his subject, Roots. The, a, um, of course, this is a, um, he, had, he chose, he knew about the novel, written by Alex Haley in 1976. But what he wrote about was the, the television series, uh, which for me was you know, a revelation as a child in the United States. To, you know, for many of us, that was our first um, occasion to really understand the legacy of, of, of slavery and of African lives in, in the United States. Um, so this writer, who unfortunately is unnamed in this piece, used Alex Haley's novel and its serialization on Pakistani television, right? the Pakistanis were watching what we were watching, but, but with some delay, and he noted a very important feature, which I had not known before, which was that um, in the original, Kunti Kente is a Muslim, uh, but in the television version produced in the United States, Kunti Kente is, is Islamic identity is, is erased. Um, and so for this writer, this was a, a, a clue to the way in which um, the Americans had engaged in a systematic campaign to rid the world of Islam. Um, so with some sophistication, this author goes through to, to explain the story of Kunti Kente and, and the American politics behind it. Um, and then he moves to the story of, of the nation of Islam in the United States and of the, the fate of, of black Muslims, the way in which uh, they had been in an error, but under the leadership of Malcolm X and others that now um, reached a kind of um, a new stage in their development, where they now have realized that um, Islam was global. Right? And that it was through the Afghan Jihad that they had seen that these sacrifices that the Afghans had made um, had, had made African American Muslims rethink their, their present and their future. Um, at a moment when not just Afghans had been suffering, but um, he cites the case of the Kashmiris and Palestinians. All of them, he argues, had learned from the example of the Afghans. So it was the Afghan Jihad, which was um, the liberating moment for Muslims elsewhere. Right? Even Muslims in America were feeling this, even though America was now um, in the position of aggressor vis of Islam. So this speech in 1991, that this, rather this, this publication, really you know, uh, kind of opened my eyes about the way in which there is a, a particular intellectual tradition which is emerging in places like Peshawar, which um, requires our attention. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's one that is extraordinarily um, global, right, in its, in its understanding of the place of Afghanistan. Um, the second one I'll cite, and then I'll, I'll conclude, is um, a speech which came two years later by a very important Hazara figure who um, so these are photographs of commodities coming to Afghanistan, which I'd like to, to show there. Mobile oil, this guy's featuring in his shop in Kabul. Um, here we have a, a wonderful market in often second-hand clothes coming from the United States. There was a, um, there was a, a very large market for second-hand clothing in Kabul, and uh, another large one in Herat, which was called the American market. And this was, of course, a, a prestige item for Afghan consumers. And here you have a woman covered, but presumably another settings, women are buying these Western dresses. Uh, print, of course, is a, uh, an underlying structural development which I highlight throughout the book. Uh, this is today, where we have a new cult of the body and body bodybuilding, kind of a fun, fun image. But um, in 1993, this figure, or one of these figures here, I hope I can find him, 
these are Shia characters arguing about Muhammad al Mazarin's slash Shia. Anyway, figures who, some of whom are, uh, these are various Afghan Shia figures who, um, at the end, create a kind of transition to the work I'm doing now on the Afghan Shia community as a transnational one. Um, but one of the figures, one of the key predecessors of these guys, in 1993, made a, a very important speech in which he argued that um, the entire world had been amazed um, at, at the story of the Afghan nation. Um, the British had solved defeat at the, the hands of the Afghans. Um, in fact, the, the Mujahideen had changed the course of history. They had defeated the British, and now they defeated the Soviets. And so this image of the world, the dunya, as a kind of um, a sphere of activity, a space of activity, uh, but also as an actor, um, was, a, was a theme that was taken up in, not just in print, but in cartoons and in, in you know, caricatures uh, that were published in these jihadist magazines of the period. So we often found um, you know, a globe being drawn in you know, cartoon fashion as, um, as a spectator of, of the actions of, of the Afghan Mujahideen, or sometimes the Afghan Mujahideen were acting on this world. At any rate, um, the sphere wasn't Afghan territory and soil, their sphere of activity was the world. Um, so this, the central, centrality of this kind of global thinking struck me as um, a key element of, of not just jihadist thinking, but indeed it's a, it's a major strand of, of, Afghan, um, of Afghan nationalism, of Afghan national thought which transcends left and right. It really animates um, today's debates about the status of Afghan refugees, the, the, the massive outpouring, the exodus of, of tens of thousands, um, perhaps hundreds of thousands of Afghans now, is very much animated this idea, by this idea that what happens in Afghanistan is um, absolutely central to, to global politics. Um, and though this is a kind of nationalist refrain, I think it's a voice that we have to listen um, to rethink Afghanistan's past and understand how we think about this present. On that note, thanks for your patience, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, the floor is open. Comments or questions? And Bob, you can call on the board. Yeah. yeah. And Steve, I can rehearse the first half hour for you if you like, but I won't. I no, no, I'm, te I'm teasing. I'm teasing you. I'm taking the rare opportunity to to call you out when you called me out for being late, just finally back in the day. That's his, <laughs> so that's his advisor. My advice. feeble, my feeble <laughs> revenge, but not really revenge. No, you're welcome. Thanks, I'm glad. Thank you for coming. You've come a long way, I know, from up in your place, and you were only like one minute late. I'm just giving you a hard time. Could I? I'll, I'll pursue on one of Please, yeah, please, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So I like very much how you lay out this this image of movement uh, of, of commodities of of. Um, of people and uh, talk more about ideas. I mean, the movement yeah. of ideas. So when we talk about uh, Afghan modern. I mean, so you yeah. say you're you're unsure, you're uncertain about the term, and yet it probably has some purchase in your case. Yes. Um, uh, what is it to be modern? I mean, what are they engaging in uh, historically in any period of time? Um, uh, what does global mean? Mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. what's their understanding, or what could be the understanding of global in this case? So subjectively speaking, in other words, mm -hmm. does that make sense? Uh, Maybe continue. Sorry. Well, <laughs> so, 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 you know, so, so I, I know that in the book it's, it's written on two levels. One of yes. them is the actual physical movement, yes. right, of, of goods and of people. Yes. Um, but part of it is also about the uh, not simply the circulation of ideas, but the assimilation of ideas. Right. Right. Um, and this is also transformative. Um, right. And so the notion, in other words, that you know, as an Afghan, you're perfectly capable of assimilating and deploying sets of ideas, mm -hmm. uh, thoughts, you know, mm -hmm. what it is to be Afghan, which mm -hmm. is also not just Afghan. Right. 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 Um, but also what it is to be part of an international community, right, of, uh, right. of um, transnational communities. Mm -hmm. Is there a way there to talk about that? On sure, I, mean, I, try to, I try to trace um, disparate strands. I think that you know, my hope was that I would survey the terrain and others will pick up each thread and dig more deeply. But what obviously is the story of the, the diaspora and their engagement with educational institutions <coughs> in the Ottoman Empire in the 19th and early 20th centuries? In Indian institutions, um, so we can find Afghans studying abroad. We find them at Cambridge. We find them at Oxford. We find them um, in New York City, right? We find them at different moments, um, working through different educational systems. And then, yeah, the challenge is to show how they bring that back to Afghanistan. Um, this is most easily done in the early 20th century, where figures like Mahmoud Tarzi have spent a lifetime in Syria and Istanbul, and they come back. You know, he he's seen a very dynamic Ottoman. Imperial landscape, which is um, in which elites are rethinking all their institutions, in which um, you know, really the his reading, his reading repertoire alone is I think is very important because he will, um, you know, learn Ottoman perfectly, so so that people think you know he's an Ottoman subject when he speaks Ottoman Turkish. <coughs> he will 
translate much of what the Ottoman reading public is into to an Afghan audience, and he will receive the imprimatur of the state to open a translation office and then begin publishing Jules Verne and other, you know, a whole range of European authors, usually not directly from you know, French or English or German initially, but through Ottoman Turkish into Dari and then later, later Pashto. Um, so in that sense, the, the record of, of Afghan letters, which actually NYU has done more than anyone to, to help us understand, the, the Robert McChesney's digital Afghan library project, there we have a wonderful survey of, of this huge project of translation, which you know, comes, mostly from, comes mostly from the Ottoman setting. But if we look to the east, um, in the case of um, here, the, the question of mobility is a bit different because uh, the Afghan state not only sends people abroad to study and trade and so on, but they recruit lots of people who um, are experiencing the, the very important transformations of Islamic education in, in the British Empire and in British India. So you have on one hand people who are studying in reformist madrasas, right? Who come with you know their theologians and they come to teach. They're selectively filtered and brought in to to teach um, Afghans who are close to the court about new ways of thinking about Islam. Um, and some of these figures are features of the the kind of anglo mohammedan um, school of 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 Islamic modernism in which they think that foreign languages are important, English is very important, um, studying British law. Uh, some kind of fighting in combination with the British state is very important for them. And so there are different strands that the, the state tends to manage to bring in. Uh, but these are all things that, which expand the repertoire of, of elite thinking about the world. And then by the 1920s and 30s, um, contacts are more direct to Europe. They bring in French and German educators. Um, and they open up French and German language schools in Kabul, which train the elite. But ultimately, really from the late, from the late 19th century, most of the Afghan elite studies abroad, um, and certainly the, the most support figures have some period of education. Um, really, it follows through to our own day with Ashraf Ghani and um, Ami Karzai. Um, but it, it really begins as early as this figure, Abdur Rahman, who spends uh, something like a decade in the Russian Empire. And then it's frustrating, we, it, I would like to know more about what this figure learned in, in Samarkand and, and, and so on, but I think some of it is we could just, I mean, what can, um, Try to learn more or less indirectly by what he says later about what's happened, but the records about his presence there I think are kind of thin. But there are lots of Afghan exile figures running around Russian Turkestan, some of whom go back. Um, some serve with the Russian army. Uh, some of these figures uh, actually join Russian forces when they take Tashkent in 1865 and they take Samarkand in 1868. They are, they're mercenaries, in fact. And some of them will cycle on to China and some back to, to, the, uh, to the Afghan state. And then partly that expertise. Um, you know, into a career with Afghan armed forces. With they joined so, the Russian army, you said? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There, there, there are several, and then they, they receive medals. They receive Tsarist medals, um, and that's very important, of course, to the Russians because it shows that this isn't a war about religion. They have Muslims fighting on the side. They can make this kind of multi-confessional argument about their own legitimacy. Um, so the one of ideas, I mean, it's 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 a challenge. It's something that's it's it's beginning, and I think that you know, I focus on it. Um, was really driven by the idea that you know most of what we read about Afghanistan is that um, this is a place without ideas. You know, it's a place without an intellectual culture. Um, in the last 20 years, we've had lots of books which survey Afghanistan, survey Afghan society, but which uh, tell you nothing about what Afghans read or wrote um, about political ideologies. You know, it's reducible to ethnic labels, um, to this vague notion of the state and, and what it wants, and the way that it is captured by one ethnic group or another, or captured by one one tribal community or another. Instead, what I try to show, show here, which you know, the Afghan state said out loud to whoever would listen, you know, this is what we, this is what we're, our state is about, and this is, um, but we had, simply haven't read those publications. I mean, the, the images that I showed from the, the kind of um, factories and so on, you know, these are state publications which are you know, cel celebrating the, the march of, of progress in Afghanistan, celebrating, you know, the Afghan national body and those sort of things. So I think that, in a way, I think I hope my book will be uh, a first pass at some of these things. I mean, um, apart from this, we have an important monograph written by a guy at Berkeley on Afghan literature. But he takes a, a small slice of Afghan literature to tell the story of, of, of this um, broader body of literature, really. So I think that we're hoping that other people will take this up, you know, Afghans themselves, of course, and we'll, we'll flesh out what Afghan intellectual history might look like. Yes, please. Uh, 
Thank you. you. You mentioned the quick move emergence of independent of Afghanistan and the Soviet state, and as you pointed out, we know more or less the story of uh, Soviet Afghan relationship post 1978. But uh, for the period in between, uh, how porous were the borders, both physical, populational, intellectual mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, borders? Uh, and uh, yeah, you did mention Gorky, <laughs> but yeah. I'd be really very curious. Great, yeah, no, thank you, thank you. I, mean, I think the fiscal movement becomes more difficult in the late 1930s. I mean, others have studied this. I think Charles Shaw has written about this. Some Soviet scholars have written about this. But the traffic that moves back and forth in the 30s is pretty vast. I mean, it's it's staggering. The numbers are, are you know, tens of thousands sometimes. Um, and some go to China. I mean, some people have multiple trajectories. They go to Iran and back. And so these border communities are incredibly mobile, trying to find um, you know, some better combination with with whatever state, right, that will allow them um, to live in security. Um, part of this book, I mean, what I try to do, I'm, I was very interested in the, the story of the Afghan left. So I try to take them seriously as something other than the, you know, the mere pawns of Moscow, which is how they're often described in Afghan sources and then described you know, in American ones. This idea that this party that seized control in 1978 you know, um, was just doing Moscow's bidding. So I try to spend some time trying to understand what they're about. And that's definitely a thread that I hope others will pick up. There's a student um, at Stanford now who I hope will do a PhD on the subject because um, yeah, I think we need a deeper understanding of, of the Afghan left because it, it's actually, I think, much more important than we've given it credit for. And then actually it's, it's emerged since 2001 to be quite important. Um, many of the figures who you know, were not killed or, or, or totally exiled who returned to Afghanistan have, and have become, I mean, to my surprise, they've become important actors. I, in Kabul, I interviewed a, a Soviet, um, well, a, a general who fought under the Soviets who controlled part of Kandahar for a long period of time. And um, we think of all people being such good Soviets as being now completely um, illegitimate in the eyes of Afghans. But in fact, he won a parliamentary seat. And now he's new. He's a new Ministry of Interior, in fact. He's a new Minister of Interior. Um, so one question I tried to ask these people was, you know, how did you come to being a leftist? Or how did you come to, they didn't like the label communist. So I had to reorient myself and pick the right vocabulary word or allow them to come to it because, um, and even the status, even these guys, the, the people who seized power, were very ambivalent about calling themselves certain labels, um, recognizing that those were potentially inflammatory in the eyes of opponents. Um, and of course, there was disagreement among them, but what seems to have emerged in the 1960s was um, you know, a, a kind of broad based critique of, of the status quo. And with people looking to multiple models, uh, looking to Moscow, but there was a, a broad swath of intellectuals who looked to China, right? So Maoism would actually find fertile territory here. Um, I kind of thought there'd be you know, people who would be drawn into the Soviet orbit um, by way of you know Soviet embassy there, or you know wanted to know what the path was to have them arrive at these things, um, and that they were quite varied. Some came to it via <coughs> the Iranian left sector, <coughs> which circulated underground. I interviewed a figure who who became an, you know, an important politician later, who said his dad owned a bookstall, his dad owned a bookshop, and they had access to lots of leftist stuff coming by way of Iran. So some of that would have been you know, Russian authors translated into Persian, but some, I think, um, I think what was more attractive to them was the idea that there were Iranian authors who were re reworking this for an Iranian context. Maybe that meant more to some Afghan readers. Um, and of course, Thousands of, of young Afghans studied in the Soviet Union, and I was, perhaps you who've met some of these figures too, I kind of thought you know, that would be an obvious path to affiliation with this political program. But um, the general I mentioned, who's now Mr. Matir, um, had a little to say about his Soviet contacts, but he, you know, he had been trained in the United States in part. He was sent to, I think, Fort Knox. And so it was part, and, and some of the key leaders of one faction of the party, which ultimately provoked the Soviet intervention in a way, yeah, he studied at Columbia. Uh, this one figure, um, Hafiz al Amin, had studied at Columbia's uh, Columbia Teachers College. Uh, the most important woman in the movement, Anahita Matevzad, um, had lived in, I think, Michigan and Chicago. She was a nurse and had done some, um, some university level work in the United States. So there's no direct path. In fact, I mean, I think the, I'd like to know more about how the American experience led them 
to a critique of the United States because they, they'd seen firsthand as exchange students. And there was certainly a, there was an a leftist network of sorts, apparently among African students in the United States. And um, one of them wrote a kind of tell-all um, describing how you know, the CIA had recruited some of them and that there was, there'd been a, a kind of political struggle among Afghan you know, diaspora students here. Um, some who had apparently accepted money from the United States were going to go back and were going to be assets for them later. I think Iranian students would tell the same thing when they're, you know, they're here in large numbers in the 1970s. They're being recruited. Some are developing critiques of the United States. Some are, are um, you know, a lot of them become revolutionary critics of, of, the, um, of the Shah's regime. So there's no one direct path, but it certainly did that for a lot of the, the people who become leftists, they're kind of gravitated to the left. They actually had wonderful things to say about the Soviet Union. Um, some of them I interviewed in Russian. They had native, native fluency in Russian. They received medical degrees there. One guy became a surgeon in, in Leningrad. And what they liked about going to Leningrad State University was you know, life in the dorm. It seemed like there was a kind of sociability they liked. You know, they had girlfriends. They had a kind of, um, you know, they had parties. They had you know, a rich social life. I think they appreciated their, their education. And some of them had very good intera interactions with some of their, their mentors. So, I think yeah, it's a very complicated story, but I hope someone else will write write it properly and in depth to really understand the. Um, you know, of course, there were throughout, as you know, during the Soviet during the Soviet occupation period, there were um, recurrent conflicts between the Afghan political leadership and their would-be advisors uh, from the Soviet Union. Right, they were constantly struggling, and we have that picture from the. It must have come from the Soviet side, the way in which the Soviets. So memoirs claim that you know their instructions weren't heeded, and you know, it's a way of, in part, deflecting blame onto the Afghans. But um, but so the, the Afghans, I think, had their own version of of a leftist ideology that they wanted to introduce there, and that was never entirely in sync with what the Soviets wanted. Thank you. Yes, please. Oh, so yeah. In the back? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask about um, the status of women and like what you Yes, please. Um, <clears throat> particularly, I wanted to ask about um, how figures like Malala are being used um, like by Western media to, like you mentioned before, justifying um, going in and like saving mm -hmm. Afghan women saving Afghanistan and giving it civilization and how Western feminists have like capitalized on that to kind of they're using Afghan women it seems mm -hmm. in a way and um, yeah yeah um, how much time do you have <laughs> <laughs> I have the next six weeks of my life we could begin the conversation um, no that's um, it's a huge subject I don't know I honestly don't know we're beginning, except I mean, to perhaps to say the obvious. I mean, what you already probably sense or know, and that is that, um, from what I understand, Afghan women's agendas don't match with their Western feminist spokeswomen, right? I mean, they, they rarely. I mean, there's there's some some overlap. I mean, there's some. Yeah, you know, I think there are multiple strands of Afghan feminism. There's some that um, speak in in a, in a manner that would make sense to their would-be protectors in the West, you know. Um, but I did introduce a group called RAWA, the Revolutionary Association of the Women of Afghanistan, who offer a really remarkable critique of, um, of Afghan politics in the 1980s. And uh, some of their archival materials are at the Hoover, um, so it's fascinating to read them there because they were, were quite prolific in, in getting word out about, um, really about, I mean, the first target was the Mujahideen. And very early on, they critiqued not just the wide cast of Mujahideen commanders, but behind them they, they saw the United States clearly, and they um, offered a critique of, um, they basically you know, blamed American imperialism for um, for creating this, they would often draw the, like a, a dragon figure with multi, you know, several heads, and each head would be one of the leaders of these jihadist parties. And so that's a perspective that I'm not sure many Americans or American feminists have really understood, but it was a, you know, throughout the period of, the, of jihad, you know, there was an exile community of these feminists who were, who were leftists. They were leftists who were critics of the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, which came to power in 78. Uh, but they also were critics of the, of the, power, the parties of Peshawar. And in fact, they were often the physical victims of that. I mean, the, 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 um, 
the founder of Rawa was assassinated, presumably by one of these jihadist party members. And so that that is quite fascinating because I think and they I would also publish letters from they would publish letters from their supporters abroad and they would publish translations of um, and they were published in English, right? But they they were, you know, for an international audience. But people would write them from Ohio and Minnesota and Belgium, and they'd say we love what you're doing for Afghan women. But but the critique was very much um, directed at Washington, and you know understood that they in many ways were, were sponsoring um, and, and directing the way the contours that the Afghan jihad ultimately followed. Um, so that sense of American accountability or responsibility for what followed, I think, is not something that. Americans in general have accepted, you know. Um, but it's striking to see that, that critique coming at an early stage from, from a feminist organization, you know, which is persistent and present. Um, so people often cite Rawa as if they're, you know, feminists like American feminists, but in fact, they're way to the left in many respects of them. And um, I mean, in a sense, you have to be some, you know, I guess anti imperialist American feminists who would recognize um, some common ground there. But, um, you yeah, know, the present, if you look at the contemporary scene, I think it's um, it's right there too. I mean, when I, this work on the, on the Afghan Shia that I've done, one of the one crucial turning point in the story of of these um, Shia figures uh, came in in 2009 when um, some Afghan clerics went to the Karzai administration and said, "We want to introduce a new family status law for Afghan Shia," um, and here it is. And they gave a draft of this bill, which was a, a major. Uh, departure from past state policies, which had always favored Sunnis. Uh, you know, throughout the 20th century, there were key moments of uh, of persecution when the state um, engaged in violence against these Shia communities. So, paradoxically, you know, one of the effects of the American intervention has been to change you know, both the ethnic and sectarian balance of power in Afghanistan. So many Shia have been quite appreciative um, of these changes and have, have, have expanded. Uh, their claims on Afghan citizenship and on religious freedom. And one mode of expression this is to say that we want um, our our Afghan Shia family law. Uh, but feminist critics said this, they they uh, dubbed this law the Afghan rape law. You may recall the the debates about it in 2009 because it it um, apparently confirmed certain privileges for men. You know, claiming that Afghan women had to submit to men um, should the men want sex at any, any time, right? Um, so this actually led to competitions out of, outside of, one figure here has, has a new mosque and school complex, and actually people clashed in front of his complex there. Um, but there were women on both sides there. There were, there were Afghan Shia women who said, you know, this is our, our community law, right? This is the new Afghanistan. You're saying it's going to be a democracy. Uh, this is what our community wants. Um, but they were, they were opposed by feminists who said this is, this is legalizing rape, you know? Um, from WikiLeaks, we know that the American embassy sent people to this guy's seminary and said, would you withdraw this, please? This is going to wreak havoc on Afghan society, and it's going to you know, destabilize things. Um, but they refused. And um, I mean, that's in which Americans are always part of the story, you know? Um, but that remains one of the contests. And so Afghan women, like women anywhere, you know, can't easily be lined up um, on one or other, other kind of side of things, or on you know, one single camp. So. Um, yeah, there's been extraordinary violence against women in Afghanistan in the last 18 months or so. But um, you know, we, New York Times had a story today about the sentences for a group of men who killed a woman named Fakunda uh, being reduced, and um, and they, they, so that in a way invests in the trope of you know the long-suffering Afghan woman, um, the victim, and that's often offered as an argument to to keep America, uh, United States engaged militarily. Um, you know, Time Magazine printed this famous cover of the woman whose nose had been chopped off, yeah. and the implication was that this was an act of the Taliban, which would be repeated should the Americans, you know, abandon the Afghans. So, I mean, gender has run through all this. I mean, it's really, um, and the story too, too, of you know, Afghan nationhood about a certain, you know, being a, a gendered phenomenon, of course. Um, but, but what's missing with that is, I think, yeah, I, I wrote a small piece, um, it kind of, yeah, in, in foreign affairs uh, last year about the, the responses to um, the killing of a 13-year-old girl who became a kind of icon of you know, the recent collapse of, of security in Afghanistan on a really broad scale. And what was striking about those marches in Kabul, which I think have been, been the, the largest in Afghan history really, really ever, um, women led much of it. They carried the bodies and of, of, they carried the coffins 
which I think also was unprecedented. Um, they led women, I mean, they led, yeah, they led, they led men in, in, in chanting slogans, which I think I gathered from Afghan friends that these were all firsts in kind of um, Afghan public life. So th things are changing, but not in a way necessarily that, that neatly aligns with what some Americans want. Which should not be a revelation, obviously. So, <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir, but you know, we only have, if we had six more weeks, we'd go into more, but we're pressed. Yeah. So you, you have a question? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, did you, did you have no. a question? I did. You can go ahead. Yeah, go for it. Um, I, had a, I wanted to ask you a sort of kind of advice after finishing this project for, for people who want to write about areas. Because mm -hmm. um, I'd sort of seen an earlier, I, I don't know if this is an earlier version of this project, but I'd seen mm -hmm. you talk when you were talking about alternative geographies of Central Asia. Okay. And then, you know, I, to me it just sort of, I, I found that really interesting because it was kind of a point, and I, again, I'm just linking it to this because mm -hmm. it seemed that by tracing biographies of certain individuals, you could, instead of like assuming where the centers were, yeah. regarding this so-called periphery, you could actually sort of see how those images sort of emerge in people's actual sort of accounting of their lives, right? Mm -hmm. like, you, you, I remember a yeah. discussion on Gun Runner, for example. Right, right. Um, so it just, you know, it, when when I heard the book was called Afghan Mod, I thought, well, it's going to be like French Mod and the Paul Ravenel, like Foucault inspired book, just yeah. focusing on the administration of things. And, yeah. and that being the kind of modernity, that's how I sort of assumed it was going to be. So, okay. um, which all, again, would be really interesting, having yeah. read the book yet. Okay. But, so I'm I'm interested in I've got to write about an area. Yeah. I, I sort of vex about it all the time and I think yeah, I see you as someone who's thought a lot about this. So having finished this project, kind of what are some major concerns that you, you okay. see yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that you think are important? I mean I'm still you may have to give me advice um, <laughs> for volume two or something. because um, I'm still I'm I'm somewhat unsettled about all these, you know, methodological interpretive questions. Um, first, the title, the modern part. I think that was, um, I mean, thanks to Steve Cochran and Laura Ingstein, I think I had, as a graduate student, I had a, a you know, I think a, a very solid training in thinking about modernity in a particular way, and um, I think I always pushed it with caution because of um, the care with which my mentors treated the subject, and so I have shied away from it fairly consistently because it didn't fit with what I thought my subjects were about in previous work. Um, and I had intended to call this book Afghan Global in a way to emphasize this is this is a way to understand Afghanistan like any other place. I mean this could be it could be Kentucky, it could be Kenya, it could be whatever, right? That is an attempt, an attempt to shift our scale from you know the hyper local, which is how we tend to study such places, or, the, or an area studies lens or a national lens and say, what happens if we put this in a global framework? What do we learn? You know, what might we, what might we miss, right? What what could be exaggerated? <laughs> you know, what, I mean there's certainly there are, there are Communities on this territory who were not uh, affected in the same way as Kabul, right? So one of my friends read it. He said, "Yeah, this is all about Kabul. It's all about elites," and um, that's true. I mean, it, it is. A, it's they are more affected by global processes than some other communities. But um, that and why? Anyway, that pushed me to, to think harder about rural communities. And so there are places in the book where I um, try to show, and I think I think there's evidence there to show that. Um, Yes, urban centers are more affected, but their hinterlands are also um, engaged in, in the kind of after effects of some of these things. So if we get into commodities, if we get into material culture, if we get into um, the circulation of news and ideas, these other communities are also affected. And so we can find traces of biographies of people who maybe grew up in a hamlet but then end up studying in Mashhad, studying in, in Najaf or somewhere. And so I think I'm going to try to look beyond the cities. And then structurally, the, with the trade stuff, um, I try to trace the, the fur trade. And um, you know, the fur trade ends up, you know, one of its global headquarters is New York City. And there's a, a period of two, three decades plus where, um, for various reasons, um, they're getting perhaps the majority of the stuff from northern Afghanistan. Uh, markets are shifting from London to, to New York, and it has to do with the war and the changes in, sh in shipping. But, uh, and, and it's marketed here. If you look at you look at advertisements uh, from Macy's and stuff, Saxon Avenue, they'll call these things you know Persian lambs or something. But if you dig behind that, it, it's coming from the north of Afghanistan. So um, you know producers there, herders, you know illiterate herders there are shifting uh, their practices to to connect to these new global flows of, of furs to New York. You know, so they're connected and they're affected by price changes. They're affected by price 
fluctuations. And I don't do that in, in very fine grained detail, but I think one can point to the general structure. You know. uh, and a lot of stuff you know, goes to Moscow and it's connected to, to, Soviet, to Soviet exports. And they, the Soviets export some of the stuff as a Soviet export, but it comes from going to Afghanistan. So there, at least I point, I gesture, I try to suggest that um, you know, even these rural communities are, are part of these global connections. You know? So I think um, in Afghanistan, in some ways, I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate this way because Afghanistan is already kind of nowhere. It's already not South Asia. It's not Middle East necessarily. If you look around institutionally, some places um, will file under South Asia. But when, when an area studies was born in the United States, it, it never found a proper home. Um, some cities look to the east, some look to the north. And so it already, even if you scratch the surface, it invites you to begin looking in different directions. But for various reasons, scholars have tended not to do that because they try to wrap a subject within a, a national frame or a thematic frame which is not open itself up to looking at transnational ties or global flows and so on. So I think, I mean, what attracts me about this set of methods maybe is the, the attempt to move along different scales. You know, and I think that um, I'm open to the critique that by calling this all global, I'm missing local particularities. I think I'm open to that. I don't, it's not really, I'm not attempting to flatten it all so that it's all out on this massive scale. But, um, and the modern part, I mean, part of this is, I think, it's peculiar to Afghanistan. I mean, not only I'm trying to normalize the story, but I think also given the, you know, I write against this idea that we need to create knowledge for American war making or NATO war making, right? But in the back of my head is a kind of an ethical quandary where, you know, um, you know, we need to understand the modernity and the kind of the way in which there's a shared temporality and a shared um, a space that we share with these other humans. You know, so in that sense, when I was wrestling with the publishers about an alternative to global, I said, you know, this is about modernity. It's not the most rigorous definition of modernity. And I don't know if Lawrence Dean Sipakin will, you know, approve of my very elastic use of the term, but it's it's you know, at root, it's an ethical acknowledgement in some way. You know, this, this is our this is a polity, this is a part of the globe, this is a kind of a part of humanity that, that um, these politics we have shaped, right, which are, who also inhabit our, our modern world um, with the kind of value judgment of modernity, right? Is that, I mean, because, and here, and it, it's, worth, it's not worth saying about every place on the planet, but it's worth saying here because this is a place that has been denied <clears throat> that status for so long, right? So um, if and when I write something else, I may never use that term again. Right? Maybe the last time I'll ever type that word. But it's fine, I'm not wedded to the concept, but I thought that it was necessary here. I, I don't know if that helps at all, but I mean, moving my scales, I think that, I mean, you know, I think books like, um, I don't know if you know this book by Dil Guillan, Bourdieu's Secret Religion, yeah, I mean, anyway, that was an, an inspiration for this, because it's a, it's deeply knowledgeable about a particular place and time, and yet it tries to think through it um, in some global fashion, you know, not the one that I have here. I mean, it's, you know, for better or for worse, it's different, but I think that that addition to scale is um, is quite exciting, right? And, and there's no one way to do it, maybe. You know, there's, there are different ways to move back and forth depending on what your material might allow you to do. Uh, I wanted to, yes, please. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to ask um, a little bit more about the intellectual history component yes. that you um, mentioned. Um, and I'm not sure where you conclude with your book, but okay. I, I'm interested in what you were saying about looking at sort of um, writings that were happening in the early 90s. And yes. uh, I'm wondering if how the collapse of the Soviet Union was discussed and whether there was kind of an idea of, okay, we are the ones that brought down the Soviet Union or mm -hmm. something like that. Or if there was, if there was any kind of overlap between um, the discussions that were going on um, in Afghanistan in the early 90s and then sort of in post-Soviet country, in post-Soviet space, talking about, you know, okay, what, um, how, how did our uniqueness as a nation sort of um, bring down the Soviet Union and that kind mm -hmm. of discourse and whether um, that was something that was, that was discussed. I mean, in some sort of like, in a lot of, it seems to me in contemporary American stuff, there'll be talk about how um, American support of the of the Mujahideen was yeah. so critical in bringing down the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. So I'm just wondering if yeah. you know how that was discussed yeah. um, in, in Afghanistan. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, also, a vast subject. I think. Uh, I mean, the book I, I try to highlight a few themes um, that we might 
place in a larger catalog of Afghan intellectual, or political thought maybe, Afghan political thought perhaps. Um, a lot of it has to do with you know, defining a nation and, and in a polity which is for most of this period a dynastic state, you know, what does it mean to have subjects of different ethnicities, how do they regard that? I think that there's an anachronistic attempt to ethnicize all of Afghan history and imagine that there are discrete blocks of people and the state is constantly managing them. But there are moments when, I think partly because of its imperial background, um, Afghan elites speak about a multi-ethnic polity and aspire in particular ways to integrate this polity on the basis of multi-ethnicity. This idea that there's a kind of expansive Afghan nation which is which accommodates those differences. But then I think because of very close conversations with intellectual currents in, in India and in Iran, primarily, I think, uh, those are the most influential for much of this period, yeah, the problem of Aryanism emerges. Um, you have competing currents which um, may you know, cut into the loyalties of Afghan subjects. So I think part of the story of the rise of Pashto as an officially backed, sponsored literary language um, really comes to, to carve out a distinctive Afghan cultural space which is not Iranian, or which cannot be claimed by Iran. So Herat can't be claimed, Persian can't be claimed, because, I mean, history of, of Afghan letters is really Persian, Persian letters, you know. Pashto was somewhat a latecomer, and it's very much part of the political struggle today. Uh, it has a great deal of symbolic importance, um, and it's part of what people are, are contesting today. But as a state language, it comes late, and I think it comes out of this, this idea of competition with an emergent Iranian national conception of a distinctive Iranian nation. So in a way, there's a you know, and, and also attuned to global processes. I think that you know this imagery I have here of the the kind of um, uh, Soviet or or German imagery of, of the gymnastics thing. You know, I think they're they're also and there are foreign sponsors constantly coming through saying we'll help you found an institution of archaeology. So the French kind of spearhead Afghan archaeology, and that conjures up more ideas about Afghan Aryanism and of um, Afghan claims to, to territorial expansion. I mean, some of the stuff is, like try to hide the book, is that, you know, these people aren't always the happiest victims of everything. And in fact, part of the Afghan-Pakistani confrontation today is about um, an Afghan imperial consciousness, right? Which doesn't come immediately from the deep past, but it's kind of rediscovered that, that the state that Amma Shah Durrani built includes places like Karachi and North India. And that is on the minds of a number of Afghan nationalists. And, so the Pakistanis, when they meddle in, in, the, in Afghan politics, I mean, they do it for nefarious reasons, but partly they do it to, to blunt these claims on, on Pakistani territory, you know, in, in the wake of the loss of, of East Pakistan and the emergence of Bangladesh. I mean, they're very sensitive about this frontier and Afghan claims to co-ethnic populations in Pakistan. So that's another strand. And part, part, another, another, yet another strand that emerges out of the Afghan-Pakistani contest um, is a, a very strong current of of anti-Zionism. So this is something that, that surprised me, the idea that Afghans would, would care about the formation of the State of Israel, that they would be following it, that it would be uh, an officially sponsored subject of conversation. Um, from before 1947, 48, uh, then all the way through I mean, to the present, that um, it's part of, I think, Afghan politics that when they think globally, uh, Palestine is, is one focal point of, of interest. You know, I mean, Mecca and Medina, um, at some moments Istanbul, and the fate of the Ottoman Empire was important. Sometimes it's the fate of India's Muslims for various reasons. But for much of the second half of the 20th century, it's about uh, the state of Israel and, and, and anti-Zionism. So that struck me as something that I mean, that's another subject that needs to be to be explored more fully. Um, since the the Soviet collapse, I mean, there you have I think you have to give a range of responses. I mean, for some of the figures who I highlight, you know, this is a, a deep defeat. Right, people have to immigrate. Um, they have to escape the Soviet Union, they have to escape to Germany or to Holland. Those are kind of the, some of the three main locales where people seek refuge after the collapse of this leftist state experiment. Um, and so, and for many figures, this is the, the end of a very progressive era in, in Afghan politics. And so, in the wake of that, one response has been, you know, for those people, there's, of course, a sense of nostalgia. But um, as Afghans send, send it more deeply into Civil War in the 1990s, um, we begin to see a kind of cult of that era, especially of its last leader, not Dr. Najibullah. And so there's now a, a pretty vibrant cult of Dr. Najib, even in Afghanistan itself, certainly the aspirant even there, where people say, you know, that the state that, that the People's Democratic Party built, you know, was a progressive one, 
and they could point to the involvement of women. They could point to um, I would say the symbolism, which goes back to this, this kind of feminist idea of focusing on veils and dress and those kind of superficial symbols, which you know mean so much to certain observers, right? To certain kinds of ways of approaching this place. So Dr. Najib has had a, had a um, you know, and then publications about him are are you know always growing, and so there's a way in which um, even people who were critical of that state have maybe softened on on the, the late kind of Najib period because um, it was the Taliban. I mean, it was the civil war that the Taliban followed. I mean, by implication, of course, it looks better. Um, and then among Afghan, you know, you'd have to find a range of Afghan points of view on how they thought about 1991 and Soviet collapse. Um, I thought you hear a group of jihadists who see, they see themselves front and center. They see the Afghan nation um, as, you know, the hero in the story, right? It's the Afghan, it's Afghan sacrifice and bravery which has brought down this empire. And some say that's enough, we're going to create our own Islamic state. Um, but some say we will take this and we'll march on. You know, we will, we will take this on um, and we will pursue a project which goes beyond Afghan borders. But that strand tends to be an Arab one, tends to be one um, that people take back to the Arab Middle East. Um, I think Afghans mostly turn back to trying to construct kind of state there. And that's probably, you know, that, that is one, um, one aspect of the industrial milieu which produces the Taliban movement. Because the Taliban movement want to, um, you know, they focus very squarely on, on statehood. And I mean, to this day, they call themselves the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. So even in the official label, there is the assertion of statehood and of legitimacy. So that's a kind of a, a deeper background, but I think the, that's one way to tell the story of the Taliban, that they are very much about statehood. And um, you know, we can call them ragtag militia, we can talk about the kind of medieval overtones, right? Um, but one constant thread has been this insistence on Afghan nationhood and statehood. And then when, you know, when Bin Laden came an issue with the international community in 1990, Six, nine, seven, eight. Um, we now know from lots of declassified communications they basically said, you know, we don't love this guy. We can talk, um, but we want you to recognize us in New York, and we we want we want to be a state. And that recognition also implied that all their opponents would be further delegitimized, and they wouldn't have to fight for the last scrap of territory that they wanted in the north. And so, um, and to this day, that's a huge. You know, if you go to their website, which is quite quite snazzy today. Uh, it, it's all about the Islamic Emirate, and so the, the noun they use for the movement is Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. And I think um, if you go back through, you know, George Washington University has this National Security Archive, if you go back and look at all these communications between Mullah Omar and the State Department and so on, they go into 2001, statehood I think is really the, the recurrent demand that the Afghans make. And that has to do, you know, that's, um, so that's a longer survey perhaps than you wanted. The, 1991, but I think they're not. Um, I mean, since then, it's interesting. I mean, you know, uh, Moscow just sent the Ghani government 20,000 Kalashnikovs, and yeah, there's been um, this guy, one of the this guy Kabulov, who's the Putin's point man on Afghanistan, recently made news in December, I think, for saying, you know, we now effectively share the same geopolitical interests as the Taliban because we share this enemy of the Islamic State in Afghanistan. So, I think as Moscow has gotten more deeply involved in you know, Turkey and Syria, uh, there's been a, a parallel search for some greater role in, in Afghanistan too. So sending arms is not ideal, right? But it's a gesture of like, kind of a, you know, an attempt to construct some bridge to, to Kabul. Well, good. Um, good or bad? Or bad? Could be bad. It's, it's, no, no, uh, it's a story of hope. It's a story of hope. <laughs> Even though we end on the story of guns. But so what I mean is, you're good. it's helpful. But it's I, mean, helpful. I mean that you're good. Well, I mean, okay. Part of the, the, the talent you have, I think, is if you you lay ideas which are which appear simple and are, and are elegant, uh, but they only seem simple and elegant after you've said them, right? And then they're <laughs> um, and, and I think that, that's, that's apparent in all of your work. And I want to thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.